Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Chat episode 345, featuring part two of my interview with Mr. Mike Whitworth, the author of Empire of Imagination. In this part of the interview, we delve a little bit into the history of Dungeons and, Dra uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It's quite a convoluted tale, as you will see. And we also get into the, uh, the copyright morass uh, surrounding this game with Tolkien Estate, uh, with Flying Buffalo and their Tunnels and Trolls game, and then, of course, uh, with Dave Arneson, the co-creator of the game. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mike Whitwer. Yeah, I was wondering if this bad group is still around. <laughs> no, no, uh, bothered about Dungeon Dragons, bad, B-A-double-D. Uh, they, they died with their, their founder, uh, Patricia Poling, who uh, I want to say passed away in, in the 90s, I think. And, you know, and Poling was a really interesting character and a very tragic character, actually. So Bothered About Dungeon Dragons was one of one of a few groups that came out against the game in the early 80s. One of these these concerned mother groups, in effect. And it was founded by Patricia Poling, who um, had a son who had committed suicide. And, and again, uh, her son happened to play Dungeon Dragons. No particular, no real connection was ever made to his suicide in the game. But again, he happened to play. And by 1982, I think it was... Um, people were already afraid of the game. They were already there was already rumors about the game being you know this stuff really snowballed. So bothered about Dungeon Dragons was one of these unfortunate groups that really got a lot of traction. I mean they were speaking all over the country in these small towns to sheriffs departments. They were going on talk shows. They were on 60 Minutes uh, in 1985 uh, talking against the game when Gary was trying to defend it, and um, and they were allies to a lot of censorship groups. I mean Tipper Gore and all the things that she was doing in the mid mid to late 80s is stuff that was very aligned with bad. So there, there was a lot of overlap between censorship and people that were afraid of these, um, these games like Dungeons and Dragons. So, I mean, it was a really, it was like the axis of evil against this game in a weird sort of way, but. Um, well, that was that, that quote in your book, I don't remember if it was, who said it, maybe it was Gary, but <laughs> talking about her and she had made some comment like, well, I didn't realize he was playing this game with his friends called Dungeons and Dragons, and the, <laughs> the comment was like, "Well, that's that's indicative right there of the level of parenting that was going on." It's exactly what Gary said about it, you know, and it's it's funny because it's one of those quotes where you know it, it's, it's um, kind of cringeworthy in a way, but you know, also insensitive perhaps, but you know, no, it is like because I mean, Gary was incensed about the whole thing. He was really. Um, he would get very hot on the, under the collar. If you watch his 60 Minutes interview, which I would recommend anyone that's really interested in the depth of this whole thing, a lot of it culminates in this 1985 uh, 60 Minutes interview he does with Ed Bradley. It's, it's a 20-minute segment, give or take. And the thing that's so interesting about it is that Gary's incensed. You can see how mad he is about the whole thing. And, and uh, so much so that he's having trouble even kind of articulating some of these, these bigger concepts. But I think he's trying to be sensitive. But at the end of the day, his game is being accused of promoting... Uh, well, of being a very psychologically dangerous and of promoting suicide and, and being involved in all this crazy stuff. And it's th it's this game that he made. And he's like, no, this is not what this is about. And then so when somebody asks him about the idea that, wow, she didn't even know that his, her kid played D&D, &D, you know, these marathon long sessions, like, wow, that doesn't I don't think she was all that involved. I mean, it's a fairly fair statement to make. But, yeah, a little bit insensitive, perhaps. Yeah, I was glad that I remember when I started getting into a D and I didn't, didn't get to play the game itself very much, but I had a lot of the novels and the computer games. And I, I remember my grandmother who was very, uh, I guess you'd say puritanical about religion. I was always afraid that she would hear the satanic panic stuff and try to put the shutdown on it. But, uh, <laughs> I remember one day she, she asked me about it. She says, you know, I've heard this, these rumors about this game. Is it, is it satanic, Matt? <laughs> I <was> know. Like, <laughs> Okay. Not to my okay. Mouth, but... I mean, she just trusted me on that, so I'll give her credit for that. Well, you know what? I will say this. It's um, as much as I make light of it. I, I will say, quite honestly, I'm a parent myself. These, like, I, I never. While it's very unfair the way the game got um, kind of labeled in this black cloud that that was very unfairly created over the game, 
at the end of the day, uh, well, first of all, it was actually very good for the game's bottom line, but you know, it was still a very hard thing for these people to deal with, people that were creating the game, working at TSR. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it was driven by people that were afraid for their kids. Like, and I can understand that part. At, at a minimum, uh, one thing I can't hold anybody ever uh, against somebody is, is that they're afraid of what their kids are into, and they want to make sure they're doing the right thing or whatever. And so this thing turned into an absolute circus. But at the end of the day, it was driven by people who were afraid that their kids were getting into things they shouldn't be getting into. And of course, in the case of D&D, it was totally all, you know, it was totally all fine. It was, it was none of the stuff was true, but they didn't know that, you know. So um, th that's where it's really kind of sad and unfortunate, really, especially for people like Patricia Poling, who really had this terribly unfortunate incident with her son for whatever his problems were, and she decides that she needs a scapegoat, and the game is the perfect scapegoat uh, in her case, and she makes it a big thing. So it's just a very sad uh, situation. But again, I can understand why these, where these fears come from. You know, we're all afraid for our kids, so I get that. Uh, so I know this is one of the probably the most, uh, I'd say, complex part of the story to tell, right? It's just the origins of the game and all these different <clears throat> figures involved and you know, I was I felt a little sorry for you when I was reading this because I know what it what it's like when you're trying to ferret out the truth when you have all these competing stories and people are not disinterested, right? They have a, a reason to want to, for the story to be spun in a certain way. Absolutely. Uh, but <laughs> you know, wow, this is so. We got three Daves uh, from Twin Cities, of course, Gary Gygax and, and a couple other people. I mean, mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, I, those so, at least are the major players. Or are there even yeah, more people? So, I mean, you know, so one thing that I, I guess I would make very clear is that there's probably more players than anybody ever even knows about. As a matter of fact, again, I, I mentioned my colleague John Peterson a couple times. He keeps uncovering new players in this whole saga, you know, because he has done a lot of in-depth research on a lot of these original fanzines, which were basically little newsletters of these these disparate gaming clubs that existed pre-D&D. &D. Um, uh, you know, so this is in the wargaming era and the miniatures era. And you find these little snippets that existed all over the place, starting as, er as early as the early to mid-60s, uh, where they found this gaming mechanic, where they found the D20. You know, and everybody, as you already suggested, there's a lot of interested parties in this narrative. So you talk to a lot of people, and, and God knows I talk to a lot of people. And, um, and you know, and I was, I was very, actually, uh, I was, was delighted to find out that people were really interested in sharing their stories. Because I needed information on Gary, right? And a lot of people had a lot of interest and a lot of depth uh, and a lot of experiences with this guy that I needed to know. Um, but to your point, uh, it's a very, very, um, it's a very complex narrative because just like any other platform technology, if you will, everything built on something else. So, uh, you know, um, I could never say that Gary invented role-playing games. For one thing, he co-created the role-playing game concept with Dave Arneson. But it goes way before that because these gentlemen um, took a lot of other concepts from a lot of their other gaming groups. I'll, I'll point to let's. You mentioned the three Daves, so let's start with them. So you've got um, all of these these disparate gamers around the country. Uh, basically, a, a couple different factions. You've got war gamers over here, which is like these hex maps with the little gaming pogs. You know, these are traditional war games. You've got miniatures players over here. Uh, sometimes. Um, it, not this, necessarily the same audience, but there's a lot of overlap, as you could expect, between war gamers and miniatures players. But they were still two disparate audiences. And then you've got people that play the game Diplomacy over here. And I mention that because Diplomacy, um, uh, put out by uh, Games Research, I think is the, the publisher of the original Diplomacy, um, which is a game, um, it, it's also a game on a board. It kind of looks like Risk. I mean, it's got a, it's a world map and this whole thing. Um, but there's an element of Diplomacy where you can take on... Um, like the Secretary of State or the, Sec the Minister of War, for example, of, of whatever country you're playing. And there's a negotiation aspect of it. There's actually kind of a narrative aspect that a lot of people introduce to diplomacy. Interesting. I see where you're going with this. <laughs> so so at, the point, at this point, there's three different types of games out there that these particular people are playing. And, and the groups that we're mentioning, the, the Daves from the Twin Cities and Gary and, and his group in Lake Geneva, they're, all, they're playing all these games. They're really interested in just playing these games. And so uh, starting in the late 60s, um, I'll mention that the, the first probably most important thing that happens is that Gary decides to host Gen Con 1, the Lake Geneva War Games Convention in Little Lake Geneva, which of course is, is about 90 miles north of Chicago, uh, at the Horticultural Hall. And the reason he does it is because uh, he's involved in a, a national group of gamers that's been trying to kind of 
take the reins of this really disparate audience across the country. You know, it's just, it's not a well-organized, um, first of all, not that many people do it. And those that do it, they have no way of staying in touch and they're spread out all over the country. I've got to so remember, Gary's there's no to, internet this time, nothing like that. Nothing like that. And so the way these groups stay in touch usually is through uh, newsletters uh, and, and fanzines, basically. They, they write these little fanzines, these newsletters. They send them out to the entire membership of their group. And Gary's very involved in that particular um, type of correspondence. And this is how a lot of the history really got uncovered, is, is that there's a, there is actually a lot of documentation about how this all kind of came together. Thank goodness, there'd be no other way to know it. And so uh, Gary's involved in a few of these national groups that are trying to put together really kind of an integrated and uh, centralized wargaming and miniature scene. So he has Gen Con in his town, Gen Con 1, 1968. It's momentous. And it, it only gets about 100 people that come, you know, and most of them come from the, the greater Midwest. A lot of people from the Twin Cities, from Indiana, from some from Ohio, and, and even a, a few from the, the East, because wargaming is actually fairly big on the East Coast in these days. Um, the, the reason it's a big deal is because it was, it, was, it was one of the first efforts to really bring people together to start playing games, and that's where the collaboration starts to happen. So come 1969, Dave Arneson, uh, this young Dave Arneson, 21-year-old or so, from the Twin Cities shows up at Gen Con 2. And uh, Dave is interested in a lot of the same things that Gary is. He plays these games, and he's been playing in a group with one another Dave from the Twin Cities, a guy named Dave Wesley, who ran a, a, a um, kind of a scenario called Brownstein. And Brownstein was... It, it was a scenario-based game where you kind of... You were like a... You would be a spy, or you, you'd, you would play some role... And you would kind of negotiate your goals. And it was, it was a tactics-oriented game. Um, and so it was kind of the first role-playing game to a certain extent. It was the first uh, time that anybody had really done a role-playing element in a gamified form. But, but it didn't really have any parameters. It didn't really have any mechanics. So Brownstein kind of died on the vine. It was just it was being played in the Twin Cities with this group that involved people like Dave Arneson. Dave Wesley's the one that put it together. And another fellow that was playing in their group was a guy named Dave McGarry. So they all played this game Brownstein. Well, as I mentioned, Dave Arneson is also interested in, in miniatures and all this stuff, and he, he gets together with Gary Gygax, who's interested in all the same stuff. And they start doing gaming variants together. They start building games together and working on a limited basis, at least, on some interesting um, gaming variants and, and, and um, different types of games. Um, well, so uh, to not get too in the weeds, what happens in aggregate is... Uh, Dave Arneson comes up with a campaign called, um, uh, basically it's a Napoleon, a Napoleonics diplomacy uh, campaign. He, he has a Napoleon game, uh, or a Napoleon era war game that he's playing with a bunch of different groups. But it's basically a diplomacy game where a lot of people are playing via the mail, right? They would send in their various moves, their strategies, their tactics via the mail. And uh, he would kind of administer this game on an ongoing basis. And uh, he and Gary came up with a miniatures uh, version, a, a way they could actually play out combat that's tied to this diplomacy game. So it's the first game, you could say, where people are doing kind of a role-playing aspect, if you will, and they're playing something out on a board. This is what gets uh, Arneson's wheels turning on a, can a campaign he starts running with some Twin City friends called Blackmore. Um, and the reason Blackmore comes together is that he's got some of these ideas in his mind, but Gary, in the meantime, is working on a game called Chainmail. Okay, and I realize this. Kind of this I, I, as I'm saying this, I'm like, wow, I don't even get this anymore. It's a pretty complex history, actually. So Chainmail is a miniatures game that Gary comes up with uh, that is a fairly complex and pretty well thought out miniatures gaming set rule. It, it's about sixty pages. And it's got, it's got um, really a lot of depth on, on how you can roll out um, a really good period miniatures game. It's not actually fantasy-oriented by itself, although I'll get there in a second. Um, it, it, you can roll it out to any different type of campaign, um, but it's got some really, really detailed rules about how to roll out a really good miniatures game. And the last section of Chain Mail has something called the Fantasy Supplement. This is what really gets important. All important, important fantasy part. supplement. The, the all important fantasy supplement that we all hear about. It's 14 pages long. And what's important about the fantasy supplement is that it's just a supplement to the existing chain, mails, chain mail rules, which can be played for a different, uh, an assortment of, of different um, types of era games. But the fantasy supplement provides some kind of overarching rules and archetypes you can use for different characters in the game. So it lays down... 
Um, first of all, a, a kind of a bunch of different classes. All of a sudden, he's talking about wizards and fighters and things like that. I don't know if you use the term fighter in chainmail. I don't re quite recall, actually. Um, but, but what's important about it is that it was one of the first times somebody had actually tried to gamify any type of fantasy um, in a miniatures or war game. Up until that point, everything was historic-based. Right. It was all about World War II. And they, prided, they prided themselves on being very historically accurate in those those war games, right? So this, would, this would be like War of 1812. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. I, I mentioned Napoleonics. That Napoleonics. was really big. People loved doing Napoleon, Napoleon era, era games. They loved doing uh, Crusade era, era games. That was the closest thing you would get in those days. You might get something regarding the Crusades, and Gary was very interested in that. But um, all of a sudden, somebody starts talking about introducing fantasy into an existing miniatures and, and you know, uh, well, miniatures game specifically. And it starts, it, it has actually some, um, it, it gets a little bit deeper than that. I mean, it actually talks about, um, gosh, I mean, it has like Wizard's Fireball. It has lightning. It, it has, um, well, a, a few different elements that actually uh, start to be the roots of D&D's mechanics. Uh, the, their actual combat mechanics. So that's hugely important. The other part is that it has man-to-man -man combat. The, the, the chainmail game has a man-to-man -man element. So they have these, these um, items called heroes and superheroes. A hero is basically four times as good as a regular unit, or, or, or one man, if you will, in, in the game. And a superhero is eight times as good. And what, what's innovative about it is that most games at the time, um, any given piece would be a multi-unit entity. Like an army, so, yeah, a little, a a little, little army. platoon and, or battalion or something. Precisely. In Chainmail specifically, uh, 1 to 20 is my recollection, is, is what the, the standard unit uh, entity is in Chainmail. But all of a sudden, you've got these guys that are heroes and superheroes that are way better than everybody else on the board, and they're individuals. So this is where it gets really interesting, is that you've got these concepts, and I, I know I didn't explain it particularly well, but you've got these concepts that have been rolled out now in this game, Chainmail, which actually kind of takes off. It starts selling very well. It's produced by a little hobby shop company called Gaiden Games. And it, it really starts selling. People are very interested in playing Chainmail, and everybody's really talking about this fantasy supplement. They're very interested in it, including Dave Arneson. So this is when Arneson takes this. He sees the various archetypes that Gary has laid out. Gary and a guy named Jeff Perrin is the, the co-author of Chainmail. And, he, he, and, he, and Arneson says, well, geez, wouldn't it be interesting if you were just playing one person. What if you were just playing the hero, and here are some mechanics you could use that are laid out in I chain I imagine them running outside naked, shouting, Eureka! <laughs> right. No, it's just really, it's a huge departure from any, anything anyone else had done. So you play one character, you've got rules for which you can lay out combat, and you've got this element of kind of, of um, playing a character and just diplomacy and, stra excuse me, diplomacy, strategy, that type of thing. So he's put he, all these pieces start to you know like kind of flow around, and Arneson starts kind of playing this um, kind of shoot from the hip method in his in his existing gaming group, and this is where it is this eureka moment where Arneson knows Gary. They're already collaborating on a few gaming variants, so Arneson brings this Blackmore concept to him. That's what the, that's what his individual campaign is called, is Blackmore. He brings it to Gary in 1972, and uh, they get together in November of 1972. Dave Arneson, Dave McGarry, one of the other Twin City Daves, and Gary and his individual group uh, in Lake Geneva. And they get together and say, this is something special. We, we can work together on this. I think this is something we can really do. And so he and Arneson work together for the next, um, well, I guess between late 1972 and the beginning of 1974, and they put together what we know as Dungeons and Dragons. But what's notable about it is that Gary took these Fairly loose concepts that Arneson had. I mean, they were. He had talked about these Arneson. notes a couple of times and make it sound like these are just <laughs> like a madman scrawls on a sanitarium and, and think, wall, sort of a deal. I think there's some truth in that. I think Arneson's. Um, uh, Arneson was a very shoot from the hip, very creative guy. Gary was a very codified. You know, he was Gary was extremely creative, but he was also somebody that could really put the pieces together and put it on paper. Mm -hmm in a really methodical way. That's something that Gary was really, really good at. And so, excuse me, so I think what, what really made it a magical collaboration was that Arneson had, had already put some, together some pieces that I, as I had already mentioned. Gary had, it was part of some of the fundamental pieces that inspired those further pieces and some of those earlier pieces. You know, so everything really built, built on itself, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And um, 
once Gary had gotten all of those fundamental pieces together, he was able to kind of write this game. He really wrote the physical majority of the game once he had these these um, these fundamental concepts together that Arneson had kind of put together for him. And so by early 1974, uh, they co-authored this game and they pr produced this game via TSR. And the rest is kind of history. Um, but I probably made that history sound way more complicated than it actually is. <laughs> if it wasn't 9 o'clock right now, I, I'm sure I could explain it better, but... You'll have to forgive me. Well, you know, people can read the book, right? <laughs> the book but explains it very well, I it's promise. It's very well explained in the book. But, but I mean, I think I, I would say it is. It, it does seem like a complicated story, especially in terms... Because all of this, of course, come back to bite them later, right? When all these copyright suits come out. And, you know, I always... When I was reading this book, I kept wondering, you know, what, what would our world be like if uh, Gygax and uh, Arneson had been sort of joined at the hip and managed to stay good friends, you know, throughout this whole process. Because, of course, they get alienated and on the other side of all these, all the copyright stuff. But uh, just to sort of, as a way to segue into this copyright, is, you know, all these sort of issues around that. Uh, I never knew this until I read it in your book. Uh, that He had actually, for the cover of that, I guess this is, what, the first edition of Dungeons & Dragons? Mm -hmm. uh, actually just copied first, that. Image or copy of the cover image right out of, right off a magazine. No credit given. Nothing. <laughs> no, yeah, nothing given. It, which which so, wasn't unusual for that time mm -hmm. at all. So I mean, this, that, I just it, it kind of stung me. It kind of <laughs> struck me like the the hypocrisy later on. You know, when it, these it guys was, are like sharks going after everybody. When here they are, totally okay with it when it suits their. Interest, you know. It was really common in the hobby circles to do that, you know, especially when they were putting out via fanzines. Like they would just take a a drawing from something and they would photocopy it or something, you know. Like there was, yeah. I mean, copyright had no meaning to the early hobby gamers, but remember, they were hobby gamers too. They weren't commercial. Yeah, they like really, a couple, maybe a hundred people playing this, right? Right, and that was kind of where it came from. So that's what made it so interesting. Was um, Dungeon Dragons was really at the cusp of be, be, you know, even Chainmail. I mentioned Chainmail was successful, but Chainmail sold a few hundred copies. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a real success by any by any way we would recognize success. So hobby people had it and knew it, but nobody knew about this game. But Dungeons and Dragons, you know, no one had ever expected this thing to ever take off to a point where copyright would have ever mattered. Um, and so that's this is the the environment in which this thing kind of grows up in. So Gary produces a thousand copies, which is an awful lot of copies of the original uh, brown box, wood grain box set of Dungeons and Dragons. And they really kind of bet their life on it. You know, he and his partner, Don Kay, um, kind of, you know, they, had, they, they put all their money into this game. And, and of course, Brian Bloom was the missing piece of that, uh, who had brought in the, the missing one third uh, and the majority of the investment to actually get these games produced. But they really bet on this thing. They really thought it was going to work. But to your point, as far as um, copyright and stuff like that goes, they are not worried about that. I mean, they're selling this through mail order hobby channels, and they think, well, gosh, you know, the, you know, the Tolkien Estate, the Strange Tales, Doctor Strange, none of these things will ever, never, ever even see our game, so we're not worried about it. Well, that becomes a big issue later for a few reasons. Not, you know, first of which is because the original D&D, of course, has Tolkien characters in it, or, or I should say more to the point, Tolkien arch archetypes, like hobbits. Hobbit, yeah, hobbits. Uh, it's got uh, Balrogs, you know, it's got some things that, that are unique to Tolkien. So they never thought this would be an issue. Um, they, they also created some other games that e existed in the Tolkien world that are right out of the, the Tolkien IP, specifically um, uh, the Battle of Five Armies. They produce a war game called the Battle of Five Armies, unlicensed, you know. And so this is all the early stuff that's going on at TSR, but they, they still think they're just flying under the radar. They don't even think they're really a real operation yet to a certain extent, even though they are really starting to sell some games and make some money. Um, so, of course, what really shuts them down on the front end of that is, is when they start getting cease and desist letters from the Tolkien estate, right? That's, that's when I think it becomes a sobering moment, moment for them first uh, for games like the Battle of Five Armies, but also for the inclusion of some of these these Tolkien archetypes in their game. So I think hobbits become halflings, and Balrogs become what? Um, I can't even remember what Balrogs become, but something else. Um, so you get things like that, where they, they start making these changes. Um, but, of course, right on the heels of that is when people start stepping on D&D's IP, right? This is what is so interesting about it. And so they're totally loose, fancy-free with, with copyright, IP, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, by what? I think 1976 is when other people start doing knockoffs of D&D. Uh, Tunnels and Trolls being Tunnels the first known example. Buffalo, I think. Right? Uh, that's right. Flying Buffalo is the producer. And, and all of a sudden, you know, TSR is in, a, is in a tiffy over this. And so they start sending cease and desist letters to them saying, you know, you can't, you know, I, you know they, they're probably not crystal clear whether their game itself is copyrightable. But, but one thing that they can point to is that games like Tunnels and Trolls are starting to promote their game talking about it like it's a similar game to Dungeon Dragons. They will mention in their ads. Well, they can certainly shut that up. And they do. But what I think is so interesting about um, how that all came about is that Tunnels and Trolls, uh, according to at least most history that I've read, seems to be the ones that created the term role-playing game. As a result of the fact is they needed a way to market their game um, without saying Dungeons and Dragons. So they it, it shows up in an early ad, I want to say as early as 1976, where they start saying, oh, yeah, here's this game, Tunnels and Trolls. It's, it's a role-playing game. And, th- and that started to stick. So D&D, while it's the first role-playing game, didn't call itself that. It, it appears that Tunnels and Trolls is the first game that actually started using that term as a result of copyright uh, concerns. Fascinating. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, and of course, you know, my work on game history, I know that the uh, TSR, they went after all these computer game makers. I want to say they went after the Zork guys because they originally called that Dungeon. You know, yeah, like, no, right. I can't call it Dungeon. You know, that infringes exactly on our right. trademarks. So, wow, what a... <laughs> <laughs> what a I, mess! I, it was a very litigious culture. I mean, um, but they you didn't know, start out that way, though. No, I mean they didn't have the money to start out there. I, I, I don't think they really had the funds to be litigious on the front end. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think it's pretty complicated because I, I think they came out of a culture where people were used to sharing ideas for free and to write gaming variants and put it in the next fanzine. You know, Gary was Gary spent years doing this. Um, so I think what what um, when the money started rolling in, I think things got really complicated. I, I really do. Um, a, it gave them the funds to actually be litigious. I think they started being attacked for some of the things they were doing, which were they, they were, you know, in violation of various copyrights. Um, you know, Tolkien's, Tolkien Estate being uh, one of, of a few examples where they, they start getting these letters. Um, so, I mean, it, I think it becomes pretty litigious pretty quickly. But here's what I think really makes it problematic. You'd mentioned that that Arneson and Gary didn't stay friends, and that's true. Um, so when Arneson, Gary is the one that founded TSR with a couple partners. Arneson was not one of them. That's a common misconception. Arneson was the co-creator of the game, and he was royalty handsomely on the game, but he was not uh, a, a founder of TSR. So he wasn't you know, a company guy until, uh, I want to say late 1970, no, I'm sorry, uh, early 76, is where they bring in Arneson as a staff member at TSR. He and a few other people, like Dave McGarry and some other people that had been kind of on the ground floor of this whole movement. And uh, what happens is Arneson only lasts 10 months at TSR. They don't get along. And it's like, in a weird te- it's like, it's like Tesla sense. working at uh, an Edison's <laughs> company, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, exactly. It, it's a very similar type of story. It's people that are opinionated, that are really good at what they do, they're creative. Uh, in this case, Gary is very by the book. He's very, um, well, I wouldn't say he's very by the book, but Gary is a guy that's able to produce an ungodly amount of material. The guy can just crank and he's con- and he's working, you know, 20 hour days and he's just killing himself and he's producing all this material. Arneson isn't that way. Arneson, um, a, you know, A, he's, he's not a great writer. So while he's got great ideas, he's very shoot from the hip and he doesn't, he doesn't put on paper necessarily uh, what he's able to produce at a gaming table, which is why the collaboration was so important between Gary and Arneson to create the original Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the other part is that I think um, Arneson isn't, he's interested in playing games of all types, just like Gary is really. They're, they're not just role-playing gamers. You know, they, they still love war games. They love period stuff. Arneson loves the Napoleonic era. Like he's really into that. So um, part of it might be a level of interest, but for whatever reason, and no one actually knows the, the actual reason why Arneson is dismissed or whether he leaves, but, but something happens where he's no longer at TSR after 10 months. And I've heard three or four different stories and accounts, and I kind of believe they're all true. <laughs> it's like a Rashomon type of story. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Sorry it was a little later than usual. Uh, I can't make any promises. I'm going to try to my best to get a new episode out next week, but I do have a summer course starting. 
Uh, so that might get in the way. Uh, we'll see. But anyway, uh, eventually you will see part three of this interview, hopefully sooner rather than later. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You have no idea how awesome it is uh, to be able to make these episodes and keep them coming. If you want to do your part to help out, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. It takes a couple seconds and you'll feel really good. It'll, <laughs> I guarantee you'll, love, you'll like the show a lot more if you actively support it. If you can't, though, or even if you do and like to do a little extra, just uh, mention it on Facebook, Twitter, a lot of that sort of thing. Help me get the word out. And hey, I will uh, thank you uh, very much for all of that. Thank you again. All right, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? some awesome news uh, here. First up, this is Stig. Uh, Stig sent this in. This is Doom 2. Uh, so Doug Keener has created a Seinfeld-based uh, Doom 2 mod. It's called Jerry's Apartment. And I wanted to read this part to you uh, from Doug about this. He says, I am a massive fan of Seinfeld. The characters were put into the replica as a bonus to add to the tribute. The only reason they are killable is because I wanted to keep it in a traditional Doom fashion. Because what is doom without violence and death? There's no, there's no way I hate video towards Seinfeld. Uh, anyway, it looks like a lot of fun, so I'll put that a link to that in the show notes. Uh, and then uh, Shane Stacks has a bit of news. He was interviewing Philippe Pepe on his uh, computer role-playing uh, game book project, which I've mentioned a few times on the show. Uh, but anyway, he was uh, sort of surprised, it sounds like, when Becky Berger Heinemann came onto the show to kind of, uh, I guess, uh, tease him maybe about his uh, not really mentioning her in Bard's Tale 3 and uh, leaving out Dragon Wars and some other stuff. Anyway, I think it's all in good fun, uh, but go check it out. I'll post a link to that in the show notes. Uh, and then we've got a Kickstarter that I think you'll be interested in. This is called uh, e Hard to Learn, or Easy to Learn, <laughs> Hard to Master, The Fate of Atari. Now, this is a 100-minute documentary, and they've already filmed all of the footage for this, all the interviews, but they need some, I guess, a boost to get, get it edited and produced and <laughs> animation and all that good stuff. Uh, but anyway, this sounds really good. they got Nolan Bushnell in there, David Crane, Manny Gerard, even got Ray Kassner. So it's quite the it's quite an inclusive uh, uh, project. I really, wanted, I really want to see this. Apparently, they did one called the Commodore Wars a while back. I hadn't, didn't hear much about that, but apparently that one's done already. Anyway, for this new one, they're trying to raise uh, 22.8K. They got 10K, so they're pretty close. Uh, so I thought I would mention that. Go check it out, see what you, th uh, see what you think. And then I got uh, two other Kickstarters I want to mention here. Uh, one is called Stygian. Uh, let's see, Stygian, a Lovecraftian computer RPG, a role-playing game of horror, loss, and madness. Now, I know I've mentioned this again, but it's for whatever stupid reason, it's, it's having a hard time making its goal. Uh, so this is a group, you know, they, they, they grew up playing all the games that we enjoy, Planescape Torment, uh, the early Fallouts. Uh, they even mentioned Heroes of Might and Magic as an inspiration, which I, I can see that in the, uh, the gameplay footage there. Uh, so anyway, they got eight, they've got eight days left, and they only need about another two grand. So, you know, please go over there and check that out. See if it's something you would like to support. It's not, it's not expensive to get the uh, digital copy tier. So uh, I recommend that you at least look at that, uh, pr hopefully sooner rather than later. And then uh, finally, whew, it's so long. It's like an epic news segment. Uh, epic Tavern is another Kickstarter. I was actually, I went in to uh, check out the, uh, the, uh, the, the one about uh, easy to learn, hard to master Kickstarter. And this one popped up as recommended. And uh, it's pretty good that it popped up that way, because I'd, I'd never heard of this until uh, I was on there. But it's Epic Tavern, Rule the Land from Your Tavern. So this is the first management, they call it this, uh, the first management RPG where you rule the land from your tavern, recruit heroes, send them on quests, reap the rewards. Now I say I'm a little uh, worried about that, because of course there's Fortune's Tavern from 2015. Uh, but... In there, you know, anyway, that is what it is, I guess. There's also another one, but uh, Epic Tavern does look a lot like those World of Warcraft taverns, so I think that's kind of a new aesthetic. Uh, the uh, Fortune's Tavern had a lot more of an RPG maker feel to it, so this looks a lot better, at least in my opinion. 
Uh, so let's see what else. They have a 40k goal, and they already reached that actually. They're up to 57k, so they're getting into some stretch goals. And this is a project by Richie Bisso, or Bisso, an indie video game dev out of Los Angeles. And he's got a really fun line in there that I think kind of sums this up rather well. He says, look, there's all these fantasy sports games out there. Why not a fantasy fantasy game? I want to manage a team of fantasy heroes. Hey, that sounds great to me, so I wanted to put that out there as well. I am supporting both, all three of these, actually, so hopefully you will, too. <sighs> all right, man, I have earned my ale of the week. Uh, this week I've got a finally back to beer again. I've been doing a lot of uh, non-alcoholic drinks for some... Get some variety for you guys that don't uh, drink alcohol, but <laughs> that's enough. Time to get back uh, to the beer. Now, this is uh, one called The Truth, which is interesting given the topic of the interview. Uh, let's see. I do solemnly swear. There's a logo there. Imperial IPA, India Pale Ale, of course, out of uh, from Flying Dog. These guys are out of, uh, where are these guys? I always forget where they're out of. Uh, Frederick, Maryland. Let's see, full disclosure, this beer came to fruition because we saw a gap in our portfolio and we wanted to increase our market share. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. You know, you always should read the labels on these bottles. There's, often you'll find some funny uh, jokes. <laughs> Maybe that's the truth. I don't know. Let's see, Hunter S. Thompson, good people drink good beer. Could have used that as my quote of the week, couldn't I? Well, let's see what else here. 8.7% alcohol. So that's actually uh, rather on the steep side. Usually when you see something with Imperial on it, that means it's going to be a little stronger than usual. Uh, so 8.7, it's definitely on the high side. It's not crazy. You know, there's 10s and even uh, 40s out there, uh, 40%. But this this definitely have a kick to it. Anyway, I don't see anything else here, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of the truth Imperial IPA here in the uh, rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> gotta say, it uh, smells really nice. Got a bit of a big foam on there, though. That's definitely one you want to pour slowly. You don't want to have uh, beer foam in your mustache. It doesn't really matter to me. Ah, you know, I'm really loving the smell of this. You get a lot of uh, kind of a citrusy, hoppy aroma. You can definitely tell there's going to be a strong, hoppy flavor to this. A little bit of a pine-like aroma. Oh, it just smells really nice, so let's give it a taste. A nice body on this. It's a kind of a creamy texture. The hops are very, very uh, uh, forceful, though. You, you definitely taste that. A little bit of a nutty, little malty flavor there. Kind of a toasted almond flavor. Uh, Really nice. It's kind of got this little thing that kicks in about halfway through. You kind of feel it up in your sinus, <laughs> sinuses a little bit. Uh, not bad, just uh, unusual. Let me try it again. Yeah, really smooth going down. It's uh, sweet. Uh, you don't really have, uh, I don't really taste an alcohol uh, taste to this, which is kind of uh, interesting since it's like 8, 8, what was it, 8.7%. Uh, you don't really taste that alcohol at all. You just taste the hops. A little bit of bitterness, kind of a, uh, like I say, sort of a toasted malt, toasted almond kind of flavor there. It's actually quite nice. Uh, very uh, refreshing drink here. I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. The Truth Imperial IPA. You know, I guess they had a hole in their portfolio, but uh, hey, you're going to fill it, uh, fill it right. And I think they definitely achieved that here. Uh, the Truth, five out of five drinking horns, no problem. Uh, try it out, do what you think, but I think you'll like it. I think for uh, the quotes for a while, I'm going to be getting them out of this book, uh, Gunny's Rules, How to Get Squared Away Like a Marine by Arlie Ermey. And you've probably seen this guy. He does a hist couple of shows on the History Channel. He was in Full Metal Jacket. and He just seemed like an all-around cool guy, so I picked up his book and read it. It's kind of one of those inspirational, motivational type books, and you know I like that sort of thing. Uh, but for our purposes, it's full of great quotes, and I wanted to read you this one today. Uh, this is from Will Rogers. It goes something like this. Even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just stand there. We'll see you guys next week.
to rip your balls off so you cannot contaminate the rest of the world.